scapegoating real problems with false solutions in order to manipulate a population. And Europe has some of the same problems today. And I have this problem with Europe. I came to this continent as a student in 1956, just 10 or 11 years after the war. Berlin was still in ruins, Dresden was flattened, East London was a car park. You could see the consequences of the war. And I know what Europe went through, and therefore I've been a great fan of the EU, but I have watched with growing pessimism as Europe began to default on its original premise of being a new source for forging a European identity and a European citizenship and a European democracy and instead became not about the European but about the Euro and about the banks and about the companies and about technocrats who knew better than local people about whether they should eat pasteurized cheese or not, or they were allowed to have unpasteurized cheese, and what the Brits should do with fox hunting. And the focus, and Mary Cantor said this brilliantly, the focus on the free movement of capital, but the restricted movement of people, is typical, I'm afraid, of a Europe that has focused more and more on its economy and less and less on its people. The finest product today of the EU is not a European, but the Euro. And had Europe spent the same time thinking about what it took to forge a European, a true European civic identity, rather than a common currency, it might have been in a different place. And we also see, and I said last night at a small dinner, we had that every time I come to Brussels, I'm surprised because je parle français pas mal, je spreche Deutsch fließend, but I don't speak Brussels. I come here and listen and I have no idea what people are saying. Because people here in the well-intentioned bureaucracy speak a language that not only do most people around Europe not understand, but I don't understand. It's a language of techno-engineering, techno-managerial bureaucraties. It's the language that in 2005 led to a 2,000-page European constitution that the French Socialist Party embraced and 70% of the French rank and file socialist members rejected. It speaks in a language of its own which most people don't understand and see as hostile to them and their identities. So Europe has to find a way to redream what it dreamed in the 1940s and the 1950s and to reconceptualize and re-express what its real ambitions are. If its ambitions are to guarantee the free movement of capital, the free reign of corporations, and the free expression of the regulatory intentions of well-meaning nanny state busybodies who want to tell people in every culture that they should live the way European technocrats want them to live, that will surely continue to fail and Europe will continue to go under in the wave of populist reactionary nationalism that we see all over Europe today. And the paradox is that it's a Europe of nations that's coming apart around the nations that constitute it. And that's why, and this will go to the other part of what I want to say, that's why I think the key to a rehabilitation, a rebirth, a renaissance of the European aspiration and the European dream has to be not about states and not about regions and not about territory, but about those communities where the majority of the human race live, cities. Those communities that produce 80% of global GDP cities, those communities where our universities and art museums and cultural institutions and innovation and entrepreneurship and patents are found, cities. It's cities that are in fact crucial. And it's not as a level of administration, please Brussels stop talking about multi-level government and as cities as one level of political administration. Cities are not a level of administration. Cities are the most ancient human communities that define us as human beings and in time as citizens. Cité and citoyen, burger and bourg, 
Those terms are etymologically linked. And if you ask people where they're born and where they live and where their children are and where they went to school and where they go to church and where they pray and they play and they get married and they get old and they die, they talk about the cities that they come from. National identity was invented in the 15th, 16th, and 17th century. Regional identity is an abstraction for administrators. The city, the Gemeinde, the Borg, the Ville, is the essential human community. And when we recognize that, we recognize it's not just a matter of acknowledging that cities play a big role in Europe, a bigger role than they've been given, but a matter of acknowledging that these are the human communities that are still vibrant. And here's the thing about cities that distinguishes them from nation states. Nation states are monocultural, zero-sum games in which the interests of one are one at the expense of the other, which is why war has been the primary instrument of negotiating differences between states. Germany gets bigger, Belgium and Poland get smaller. But Brussels? Berlin and Warsaw can all flourish. Cities are non-zero-sum games. Cities are not territorial. They're on territory, they're in a place. But their essence is multiculturalism, diversity, trade, openness, invention, innovation, all summed up in that term urbanity. We use the term urban, but think of the term urbane and urbanity which refers to open societies, to diversity, to understanding, to tolerance, to reaching out. You can't wall in urbanity. Urbanity is itself the defeat of walls, insisting there aren't walls between peoples. And that's why while states are still monocultural, the English nation, little England that just resented and repelled Europe, La France, Germany, Spain, Japan, Mexico, organized around, in their essence, they're monocultural. And then think of cities that are organized around creativity, civic identity, and are, from the beginning, they've been diverse and multicultural. And as a result, cities look like the world, which is why immigrants go there and why cities are much more open to them, because cities embody and represent and manifest that diversity that is the world's strength. And cities will say, we like diversity. It makes us strong. It makes us inventive. That's why artists come here. That's why creators come here. That's why people willing to work hard come here, because they know they can get ahead. That's why I've met taxi drivers who have worked in London and Delhi and New York and Mexico City. And they move around. And they're just taxi drivers. They say, yeah, I, lo I love cities. And I'm looking for the best place to be a taxi driver, to be a hack, to be a cab driver. That's the nature of cities. And so when we talk about, as I would like to, not just a Europe of states and regions, but a Europe of cities, we're talking about a Europe of ancient institutional communities that define our species being, our political being. When Aristotle said man is a zoon politikon, a political animal, he meant a creature of the polis, someone who is who likes to be politically associated, likes to be near others. Proximity. We think of cities as economic engines, and they are indeed that, but that's only secondary. People love to be in cities because they like to be near other people, and they like to be near other people because they like what that friction, that creativity gives them. Young people come to the city, yes, for jobs, but much more importantly for the the life. You might remember in the 1980s in the United States and here in Europe, a lot of corporations started moving to the suburbs because they thought they could get cheap property and so on. The experiment failed within 10 years because none of the middle managers wanted to live in the suburbs. They wanted to live in the cities and all the corporations moved back into the cities. Not for economic reasons, but for civic and city reasons because the city was where they wanted to live. So what I want to suggest to you today is that Europe, to retrieve its identity and its dream, needs to focus not on rehabilitating the state, begging states back in, trying to overcome the populist nationalism that so many states are now expressing, but to reorient its governance and to reorient its governance around the institution of cities, to make it a Europe of cities. I know that's hard because Europe is constituted by states and the state principles are not happy with that. 
Europe needs a more radical vision than it has to say sorry, but the states that you represent are abandoning us, and to preserve Europe, we have to go to your cities, and we have to think of you in terms of your cities. That's a radical project, I know, and a difficult one, but it's absolutely a necessary project. It's how Europe and the dream of a transnational, a transborder, a borderless Europe will be secured. So let me end by suggesting then that it's not just about thinking of cities as another level of government and paying a little more attention to them. It's not just about remembering that cities create the wealth that are the tax revenue stream that nations and the EU take and then dole out as a gift to the cities that have produced the wealth. It's that cities are essential historical institutions that define who we are in a multicultural and open way that represent exactly what it is that the European dream and indeed the global dream represent. Because Europe is not just a matter of overcoming borders and dealing with interdependence, it's dealing with it democratically, justly, fairly. That's the dream, dealing with inequality, as you said. And to do that, we need to turn to institutions and communities that are good at it. The nation state is stuck in the middle. Cities are much more global than the state. The, state is still, the states become parochial. We used to think of the state as the universal association. Today, the state is parochial, and the locality, the cities, are much more universal even in terms of the progressive agenda in the United States, it's cities where you find gender equality, higher minimum wages, and a progressive vision of civil rights. And at the national level that Trump now occupies, you find a reactionary, small-minded, inegalitarian vision. So cities hold out great promise. It's not that the cities need Europe. Europe needs cities and needs, find, needs to find ways to not just draw them in and make them the instruments of Europe, but to recognize their potency and their capacity to rekindle not just the European dream, but the global dream of an interdependent world that is not just defined by monopoly corporations and global terrorism, but is defined by global sustainability, global justice, and global peace. Cities are the hope in these very dark times. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm going to try to bring this down to earth a bit. I was asked to talk about the possibility or not, as the case may be, of having quote unquote, sustainable cities by 2030. To be honest, I don't know. But what I do know is that there are two possibilities, to put it simple, by 2030. Either our cities are going to further disintegrate in socio-ecological chaos and violence, as we see almost on a daily basis, or we move towards an urbanity that is ecologically a bit more sensible, socially, a bit more inclusive and globally a bit more equitable. Yesterday evening after dinner, I spent the evening with my daughter. She lives in Molenbeek, just a mile from here. This is a different city. The city here and the city a mile over there is socially, ecologically, and in terms of its urbanity, a different world. There is no such thing as a city. So I am rather more interested in the question of urbanization from a socio-ecological perspective. So first of all, it's vitally important, I think, to recognize that planetary urbanization is one of the main drivers of, socio, of the socio-ecological, because every ecological issue is a social one, every social issue is an ecological one, is the main driver of the socio-ecological predicament that the world is in. Not only does the majority of the world's population live in cities, that is well known, but a large number, I would argue most of non-urban activities such as food production or resource extraction are directly related to the continuation and intensification of the world's and Europe's intensifying 
urbanization process. Indeed, the sustainability, quote unquote, of our everyday urban life, our urban life is predicated, uh, uh, accounts for 80% of the world's resource use, 80% of the world's the global ecological degradation, and 80% of the world's waste. Our emails alone account for 1.2% of the world's total greenhouse gas emissions. That's about half of the total UK greenhouse gas emissions. So much for the smart, sustainable city based on IT technologies of the future. What I wish to foreground in this contribution is how these urban routes that structure global socio-ecological flows are customarily ignored and how the feeble Techno-managerial attempts to produce more sustainable forms of smart urban living actually continue to sharpen the combined and uneven socio-ecological conditions that, mark, that, that marks the urbanization process. So I see urbanization, and I think the way we should see it, as a socio-ecological process. The city is not a thing, it's a process whose functioning is predicated upon increasingly longer, often globally structured metabolic flows that fuse together human and non-human stuff in socially, ecologically, and technologically mediated but deeply uneven and inequitable, inequitable, inequitable ways. So I'm therefore not that much concerned with the question of uh, nature or ecology in the city. Everyone loves trees and birds in the city. I don't care. I am rather more interested in the urbanization of nature. That is the process indeed through which all manner of non-human stuff, from a wide range of localized ecologies, like my sweater comes from Lamb in Mongolia, it's a very good quality sweater. From a wide range of localized ecologies are socially mobilized, economically incorporated, biochemically metabolized, and geographically moved in order to support the urbanization process as we know it. Consider, for example, to exemplify that, how the everyday functioning of urban IT networks, social media, of which we can't do without if I see the number of people doing the usual stuff, smart infrastructural networks, alternative energy systems, and eco-architectures, informatics, and the like, or predicated upon mobilizing, among others, mineral, uh, minerals like coltan, that's columbine tantaline, from some of the most socio-ecologically vulnerable places on Earth. Upon, upon the global uh, production chains that are shaped by deepening uneven socio-ecological conditions, and upon a recycling, quote-unquote, process that returns much of our European urban e-waste to the socio-ecologically dystopian ecologies of the suburbs of Mumbai or Dhaka. These processes are indeed infused by all manner of power relationships, and not of course sustained, but also the imaginaries of what nature is or should be. Indeed, urban sustainability. Anyone against urban sustainability? No, I thought so. Urban sustainability has indeed become the empty signifier that refers generically to this phantasmagoric vision of a world where people, economy, and environment interact in mutually supporting and reproducible manners mediated by increasingly smart technologies that micro or occasionally macro engineer the delicate balance between humans and nature. The term sustainability, now enhanced with adaptation, mitigation, and of course resilience, has become consensually accepted as the normative ideal that might with the proper techno-managerial arrangements, then the, our ecological urban predicament not only bearable, but permits civilization as you and I know it, not those of Molenbeek, that you and I know that permits civilization as we know it, but as the us here, uh, to continue a while longer without engendering significant social political change. That's the sustainability challenge that is being pursued by our European cities. A number of assumptions sustain this vision. First, 
There is a general consensus, an agreement that the ecological condition the world is in requires a serious, important, if not radical, techno-managerial and institutional change. Everyone agrees, perhaps not some, but most agree, that the world, uh, 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 to make sure that the fundamental social and political economic configuration that we inhabit, that is neoliberal globalized capitalism, can continue for a while longer. That's the mission. Second, this ecologically sensible neoliberal globalization, uh, this can be achieved allegedly by recognizing the inefficient and ecologically irrational mobilization of the world's resources the development of new smart eco-technologies that are carbon neutral and resource efficient seems to point in the right direction. That is to change radically so that nothing really has to change, to paraphrase a famous Italian novelist. Third, ecological modernization based on the mobilization of that kind of eco-technical rationality, good governance principles and the internalization of negative externalities within a market logic, such as ecosystem service trading or carbon trading, becomes the ideological, not a rational, the ideological glue around to which these principles gel. The sustainability edifice tends to focus on the techno-managerial complex as panacea. In doing so, questions of socio-ecological inequality, environmental destruction, Democratic political disagreements and uneven structures of socio-ecological power are customarily sidelined, marginalized, or completely ignored. In other words, these techno-managerial sustainability attempts are depoliticizing, or as I would prefer to call it, post-politicizing. We're not living in a post-truth society, we're living in a post-political society, as I've argued on a many occasions. And it's precisely that that nurtures a populist disdain for techno-managerial elites like us and silences the debate over really possible alternative trajectories. Indeed, despite the emphasis on sustainable and smart eco-technologies and the consensual concern with sustainable urban policies and lifestyles is the kind that I try to pursue. You recycle your batteries too, I assume. Global urban ecologic, ecological conditions continue to deteriorate at an alarming rate. While the techno-managerial elites desperately attempt to micro-engineer socio-ecological relations in ways that permit both sustaining economic growth indefinitely and turning environmental technologies into smart green growth Strategies, the depth and extent of, external degrad of, of environmental degradation gallops further. We all know, of course, every expert knows that a two degree uh, uh, a maximum of global warming is not going to happen. It has indeed become abundantly clear now that the, ecolo that the ecologist clarion call borrowed from the 20th century Italian communist Amadeo Bordiga that when the ship goes down, the first class passengers go down too, is manifestly untrue. You must have seen the Titanic movie. The first class urban passengers in our European and other cities are busily building exclusive smart technolog technological rescue ves vessels in their eco-gentrified sustainable parts of the city. That's where I live in Manchester too. It's a very eco-gentrified place. I love it. I never ventured into Moss Side. That's where Manchester United Stadium is. So the first-class urban passengers are busily building their e-pods uh, while socio-ecological refugees drown in the Mediterranean and others continue to live in the proliferating wastelands of their degrading urban environments. So what to do, I'm going to conclude. I shall provide some pointers in the direction of perhaps a more politicized engagement, which is, of course, what I'm calling for. So the first thing is to recognize that 
sustainability, quote unquote, is presented as a consensual, almost humanitarian objective that disavows or ignores the fact that many of the techno-managerial practices associated today with sustainable urbanity they produce socially and ecologically highly uneven outcomes with winners and losers. These socio-ecological inequities should be identified and recognized. Two, urban environmental policies should explicitly take into consideration the uneven socio-ecological patterning that permits the unfolding of new technologies, smart infrastructures, or alternative energies. Say, for example, the introduction of smart eco-technologies in Heidelberg. I use Heidelberg because it prides itself on the sustainable urban policies, are well, often manufactured or recycled in dehumanizing, socio-ecologically degrading environments elsewhere. And these are parts of the same coin. Third, the deepening enclosure of the commons and the privatization of all manner of non-human natures. I'm a water expert. Um, yet it remains still one of the key drivers of market-led urbanization. Defending the egalitarian access and use of the commons of nature is a vital strategy towards a more socio-ecologically sensitive form of urbanity. Continue support, therefore, to those actors and social groups that defend the democratic commons against enclosure and privatization is therefore vital. Fourth, and I'm coming to the end, marrying economic growth with socio-ecological sustainability, that is the elite's wet dream, is it not? That's what we really want. It's not possible. I maintain, and with me many academics maintain, it is not possible. The central contradictions between the mobilization of ever more resources as the economy grows and becomes more ecologically efficient at a compound rate and sustainable patterns of planetary urbanization in the context of planetary constraints cannot be sustained. So we desperately need, desperately need to explore alternative and different possible trajectories. I would like to invite the think tanks to start thinking about that. And finally, policy analysts and policy makers should make explicit the political choices and uneven socio-ecological implications of their practices. Instead of presenting the interventions as consensual, universally good, socio-technically neutral, and serving the whole of the human and non-human community, while relegating those who disagree to the margins of intellectual and political respectability. These are those who answer to the call of populism. We love to hate them, don't we? What needs to be recognized is that the community European or otherwise, does not exist, but is fragmented, unequal, and internally radically heterogeneous. In conclusion, and most importantly, therefore, decisions over urban socio-ecological trajectories need to be democratically, and that is in the context of real dissensus, where our voices and the voices of those who live a mile from here are heard on an equal political basis. And that should be done rather by an assumedly neutral techno-managerial expertocracy. Thank you very much. And, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you can share my impression, but we heard two so interesting and exciting contributions as we need now more than a day for the discussion. <laughs> but we have exactly mean minus two minutes. <laughs> minus is, two, we started uh, late. I mean, it, we started very late. I mean, yeah, yeah, but we don't get our hour? Come the, on. the problem is with uh, starting too late, that the time is going on even if you start too late. And so I, I, I uh, must uh, ask you if we can postpone a little bit uh, the coffee break that you need also, I think, after this important contributions. And I will not 
ask the questions that was prepared for me, but I will simply give you the floor for the one or the others to, to say something uh, uh, and to participate on this very, very uh, interesting uh, debate about the future of the citizens and their important uh, role in the European evolution. Please. Um, Leopold Schmerzing, I'm from the Global Trends Unit from the European Parliament Research Service. Um, um, my question goes to Professor Barber. Um, there is a very old philosophical debate going on um, between the citoyen and the bourgeois. Uh, the person that is um, the citoyen that comes from the city that is um, ever closer co-decider of the police and, and I think you took a very convincingly side with the citoyen over the bourgeois. The bourgeois is more the Rousseauian type, the, 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 the uh, noble savage, the person that is in the countryside that wants to be distant from, from politics, distant from deciding and, and has his, um, the good life in the countryside and doesn't want to be a co-decider. And there is there's, uh, some reason to believe that that also can uh, be a happy life and, and a, a society should encompass these people as well. And I just wanted to ask, what's your opinion on that? So another question from there. Give the microphone, please. There. Okay. Thomas Arnold, DG RTD. In this vision of cities, what is the vision for non-urban spaces, for rural areas, and for the interaction, the interdependencies between rural and urban areas? Thank you. Uh, another one, so we will also work with three questions so we can continue the tradition uh, from the panel before. Please. Yes, uh, Leo Schottenartold from the Council Secretary, Council of the European Union. To Professor Barber, uh, I listened with great interest to your expose about cities and <coughs> about the nation states uh, making war and cities being supposedly peaceful. I'm a historian myself, I did my PhD on a city, Venice, which was a city state, and uh, in, uh, actually the truth is that in the Middle Ages, when cities grew real powerful in Germany and in Italy, they did. Uh, fight each other in extremely bloody ways, uh, uh, exactly like they built territories, that was their nature. Uh, I wonder if we go back in this very different context, what would be the new factors that would make a difference in your view, hopefully. So I give you the floor for perhaps a little bit shorter uh, interventions than before, but now you have the floor. Uh, I'm a historian too, and uh, yes, city-states fought, although they fought in the context of the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, uh, and of a lot of other forces. Uh, but we're talking about cities today. I'm not, we don't have to relitigate uh, history. What we do know is the last 400 years, uh, nation states, territorial and bordered, have been the source of, uh, of war. I, I believe cities today represent communities capable of cooperation, negotiation, and living together in a way that states don't. And I think they prove that every day, not just in a new organization like the Global Parliament of Mayors, but in decades of networks uh, like UCLG, ICLEI, the C40, Euro Cities, US Conference of Mayors, and I can name dozens of them, where cities cooperate and work together and find uh, solutions to problems that nation states can't. On the important question, and I think we can link the two previous questions because they're both about the relationship between country and city, the kind of uh, bourgeois uh, notion uh, and the, the citizen who comes uh, from the countryside and those in cities. We don't want to, to be sure, take the old antagonism between city and country and change the valence so now it prefers cities to country, it used to prefer country to cities. But two things, one political. The fact is in the United States and Europe, the countryside and agriculture have determined the political fate of this land and of America for a very long time. A minority from the countryside and suburbs control the majority living in cities through the rigged institutions, through the electoral college, through gerrymandering, in ways that let's now reverse it a little bit. Let's give cities, the urban, a little more importance than we have. Yes, the time might come when we say, gee, cities are just walking all over rural areas and agriculture. That's not true. Look where the money goes, look where the subsidies go. Even now in Europe, agriculture and the hinterland and the so-called regions get the lion's share and urban cities 
get much less. The other point I want to make, however, is a more ameliorative point. I know my book is called If Mayors Rule the World, and I'm talking about cities, but actually the modern unit is not the city. It's the metro region. And metro regions are the extended bodies that include city, suburb, exurb, and the immediate landscape around that has agriculture and the watershed and so forth, all of which need to cooperate. Italy, through Matteo Renzi, the former mayor uh, of Florence, has just instituted a constitutional reform to get rid of the old provinces in the Senate and put nine metro regions throughout Italy in their place and organize government that way. Anne Hildago in Paris has organized a new notion, she borrowed it from Sarkozy, of Grand Metropole Paris, which takes the 20 rich arrondissements on the inside and then puts them together with the three départements on the périphérique and beyond. That's an attempt to, it internalizes some of the quarrels, it doesn't solve them, but it puts them inside a single body. So metro regions are a very powerful way to deal with these problems. And let me give you one instance. People always say to me, and I talk about cities, they say, Detroit. You think cities are great? What about Detroit? And it's true, Detroit, as it was established in the early 19th century, along those city limits, is a bankrupt city, a victim of globalization and the end of manufacturing in the United States. And it's gone through bankruptcy and a lot of problems. But guess what? Look at the 10 counties around Detroit that make up the greater Detroit metro region. Those 10 counties are the fourth richest region of the United States. They have a lot of new tech, they have a lot of the information economy, and a lot of Detroit automobile industry, which fled Detroit, didn't go to Mexico and Korea. It went to the 10 counties around. If Detroit were the greater Detroit metropolitan region, it would be a viable area with a pocket of inequality that they'd be in a position with those resources to deal with. So one way to deal with the rural urban, the agricultural manufacturing economy, the new information economy and the old economy, is to think not about cities but about metro regions and see if we can't, with that notion, incorporate the region that Europe still talks about into cities, but these metro regions have to be metro-centered, not region-centered, because one trick is, in England, the, the, uh, the, the, the government of George Osborne and Cameron used devolution to metro regions, and the idea of metro regionalism as a way to kill the cities, and not to empower them. So it, it's a delicate and difficult instrument, but it's a real political instrument. And here I just want to say to my friend who, whose views I think are very important and who I respect though, but we need a political mechanism simply to say we have to empower those people, we need democracy. Yes, we do. We've always needed democracy, but claiming the need for democracy is not to find it. And you may disagree with me, but my argument is that cities are a way towards democracy. Trust levels in city government are double those of national government all over the world. A poll was done three years ago. 80 nations were uh, polled. Citizens said, do you, when asked, do you trust national government? 35% said yes. 65% said no. When they are asked, do you trust your local government, it was reversed. And we know that trust levels are, are much, much higher. So I would argue that cities are a way back to, yes, there's many problems in cities and corruption and inequality, but cities are a way back towards democracy, not an alternative to it. Oh, and I give you the floor now. Just very just for quickly, yes, cities have always been the sites for processes of emancipation and democratization. Now, we've talked for two days about democratic institutions, and we know that they sometimes fail and that they're not perfect, and that is fine. But we should not confuse democratic institutions and how they function with the process of democratization. The process of democratization and emancipation is the struggle to include those who are excluded from the institutional configuration to become part of that. Democratization is never given. It's fought for. That is what the historical urban process has shown to us. And I would argue that that is today what we are back at. And this is the choice that we're confronted with. I've heard for two days a lamentation about populism, which we discovered after the Brexit and Trump. As a Belgian, I discovered it on the 13th of October 1983, when the fascist extreme right-wing Vlaams Bloc won the election of Flanders 30 years ago. So I did not need Brexit. 
or Trump to discover that. But what I did not hear anything about for two days now is the extraordinary democratizing struggle that has been unfolding in many of our European cities over the past few years, and which are radically different, I would argue, from the nationalist, identitarian, populist movements. I'm thinking here of the Indignados in Spain. They actually got a new mayor in Barcelona and in Madrid. I'm thinking of the outrage in, Sp uh, in Greece that helped to transform the political institutions, whether you like it or not, it did do so, and that is happening in many places many cities across Europe, and I would insist we should radically distinguish these universalizing, democratizing movements from the kind of identitarian populisms that we love to hate. So that's on, on the polis issue. On the country, city-countryside divide, uh, of course, there is still a big difference between the agglomeration of people and stuff we call cities and the kind of rural environment, but I would argue that in today's planetary urbanized context, there is nothing outside of the urban any longer. But that, I mean, I have a, a second <coughs> house on the countryside in Greece, right? I need my IT access. I need my smart technologies to work. I need to have access to my food, my clothes, my energy, etc. Even this small, very rural village that is, that is radically different from the urban is fully incorporated within the process of planetary urbanization. That means, therefore, that if you want to take the ecological configuration of which the non-urban is a vital element seriously, the struggle over that resides in the urban not in the non-urban. Thank you very much for your very, very interesting contribution to this.